We have a dynamic word from the book of James chapter 2. James chapter 2. During this month, we're going to be studying this book. Uh, we're going to be digging into it and understanding the truth of the, the brother of Jesus. The brother of Jesus, I, I think, is one of the most uh, evidential reasons why you should believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. Because his own brother testify that he was the, the sinless lamb of God. If anybody had the dirt on Jesus, it would have been his brother. And yet he was inspired by Jesus in the same way we are inspired by Jesus, knowing that he was the son of God. And so he writes this book to a church that is struggling, to a church in Jerusalem that uh, has, has Jesus, they confess him, but they have all these issues in their life that they're dealing with. They're, they're lukewarm, they're struggling in a lot of the same ways that, that we're struggling. And so James writes this, this letter to the church in Jerusalem, and uh, uh, we, we read last week about chapter one, and now we're going to go chapter two. I'm going to start in verse number one, and uh, are you ready to read God's word this morning? Yes, all three of you? All right. Well, at least your pastor's excited, because if your pastor's excited, then that's really what matters, because if he's not excited, then what are we even doing here? All right, here we go. Verse one. Uh, my brothers and sisters, talking about family, the family of believers. We're not a crowd. We're a, we're a family. Uh, and, and those that are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Uh, not talking about having like a favorite team or, uh, you know, a favorite restaurant, but in the family of believers, the, the, the sons and daughters of God. We can't have favoritism. And uh, it says, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and then a poor man with filthy old clothes also comes in. And if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, hey, here's a good seat for you, uh, but say to the poor man, go sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This is something that was going on. They were discriminating on, on appearance. They were discriminating based on economic status, based on uh, race, based on pedigree, based on their resume. And they, they, they were getting called out on it. And James is upset. He says, listen, my brothers and sisters, God has not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. It is, not the, is it not the rich who are exposed? extorting you and exploiting you? Are they not the ones that are dragging you into court? And, and now the ones that are dragging you into court you're trying to appease? Uh, are they not the ones that are blaspheming the noble name of him who you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, and I love that Diamond talked about this this morning, the royal law, the golden rule, love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favoritism, another version says, uh, if, if you show uh, um, preferential treatment, if you show partisism, uh, if, if you do that, you are sinning. You sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. Isn't that the one that always gets us? Like, we always have our categories of good people, bad people, but yet if you're guilty of one, in God's eyes, you're guilty of them all. For he who said you shall not commit adultery uh, also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, any murderers in here? Don't raise your hand. I'm just <laughs> too much, too early. Sorry. Uh, if, if you are a murderer, but don't, commit, but don't commit adultery, yet you are guilty of both of them, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And then a few more scriptures. I'm just getting started. Anybody excited that we're just reading the word this morning? God's word. All right, here we go. Verse 14. Uh, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes or daily food, and if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, God bless you. Change your confession. Go fill out a resume. But does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Anyone believe him? There's one God? Yeah. Can I get a witness? 
Good, because even the demons do that. <laughs> I got you. Uh, he's, 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 oh, oh, good, good, because the demon and the devil believes that. Good for you. Uh, and, and, and they shudder. Uh, and you're a foolish person. That's the end of my scripture reading. You're a foolish person. Thank you for the encouragement, James. Appreciate that. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. Uh, I pray, Father, that you will challenge us, that we could be convicted and convinced of who you are and what you are calling us and asking us to do, Lord God. Uh, I pray, Father, that we won't just be hearers of the word, sayers of the word, but we will be doers, that people will know us by our action. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Go USA, by the way, number one gold medals. We overtook uh, China last night. Shout out to the women's basketball team putting us over. So I thought it would be appropriate for me to rock my USA jacket. <laughs> uh, so thankful for, for my country and, and the fact that I get to live here and be a part of it and, and proud of uh, all of our Olympians, all, all of those who represented us. Uh, challenge. Uh, have you ever been challenged before? How do you handle when somebody challenges you? When you're challenged by a situation, do you immediately become defensive? Do you immediately uh, clam up and, and let the person know the reasons why you cannot change or you cannot get over that hump that they're challenging you to do so? Uh, one thing that uh, I, I love about, and this is my, my daughter, Lily, that is not in service, even though I'm going to brag on her. I wanted to be here when I was bragging on her. Uh, one thing I love to do with my daughter, Lily, is I love to challenge her because I, I know what she's capable of. Uh, like my, my daughter, Lily, before this, this summer, uh, one thing we knew about her is she loved, she loved the water. Like literally go to the beach, she would stay in the water until we drug her out of the water. She would stay in the pool all day long. She loved it. She just loved to be in the water. And we thought, you know, it would be great uh, if, if we could, you know, get her into swimming. That, that seems like a, a no-brainer, get her into swimming. And so uh, we signed her up and, and she went to swim camp. And then we signed her up uh, to be on a swim team. Uh, now, fortunately, these swim teams, you don't try out. They just throw everybody in the pool. Like, like you know, you're, you're not going to die. You're on the swim team. Team. You know, you could doggy paddle, great, you're on the swim team. And, and so Lily was on the swim team. And, and, and one thing that they made everybody do, I remember the first practice, I dropped Lily off, this is in June, and we go to the first practice, and the first thing that they have everybody do, the first practice, is, is they have to dive in the water. And, and, and Lily, uh, um, terrified, terrified of, di of diving, terrified, like, like the fear in her eyes is like, like real, it's real. You know, anyone ever seen that? Just the fear in somebody's eyes where, where you know that they're not faking it. And, and so I was trying to work on, on, on this with her at the house and we have her, a pool and I'm, I'm trying to get her to dive in. And, and Lily does flips. Lily could do cartwheels. Lily does handstands. Lily could walk on her hands. I'm like, Lily, just do a handstand into the pool. And she wouldn't do it. Like we would say, okay, Lily, dive in. And she would just breathe. I beg, Lily, I know you could do this. Just dive in the pool. And she wouldn't do it. And, and then I'd, I'd make her do it again and make her do it again. And then I remember this was one time I picked her up by her ankles and, and I walked her out and I, and I just dropped her in. I'm like, see, you're fine. And she, she, it, was, it was like a little conflict. She was mad at dad, like, dad, you're pushing me too hard. I'm like, Lily, but I know you could do it. And, and she cried and, and we had like, like this, this, this fight at, like at her house. I'm like, Lily, I know you could do it. And, and I'm trying to challenge you. I know you, it's in you. And, 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 and I remember the first time at, at practice, she's, she's sitting there and she would not dive into the pool. She's the last one. She would not. I'm like, oh, honey, we got a problem. And the instructor's like, we got, we, we got a problem. Like, like, we can't have her, like, on the team unless she could dive into the pool. And so finally she learned just kind of, like, to fall. Like, she got really good at just the fall. And, and so she fell in the pool, and, and, and we worked on it, and, and, we, and I challenged her, and, and she didn't like it, and we got in fights, but, but I challenged her, and I challenged her. And, and, and what was so amazing is, is that because uh, she had somebody there to challenge her because she knew what, I knew what she was capable of, she was able to overcome that hump. And she was able to receive the challenge and do something that she didn't think she was capable of doing because somebody saw something in her that she didn't know that she had. 
And, and what was so, I was so proud of her because, uh, and, and I put this all on Facebook, so this may not be news to everybody, but uh, she, she got selected to be one of the final swimmers in, in all of, of Silton Swim Camp. She was, I think, one of four swimmers that got chosen, and they had the, this I am relay at, at the very end, and she had to dive in the pool. Like, when somebody touched the edge, she had to dive in, and they're going up against, like, all these, like, like bougie programs like the Atlanta Club and Manasquan River Country Club, the, the Spring Lake B&T, like, like, all these, like, like, you know, they've been swimming at the country club since they were three years old, you know, getting like thousand dollar, you know, lessons. You know? And, and so here's, here's, here's Lily and, 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 and their team's going and they're going. And, and it was so amazing. She didn't hesitate one time. Dove right in that water. There's like 500 people there. I, I was like the psycho dad. I said I was never going to be the psycho dad. I am 100% the psycho dad screaming, get out of my way. I can't see my daughter to the, the, the you know, middle-aged woman in front of me. You know, <laughs> like, come to Shore Christian Church. <laughs> Just don't stand in front of me when my daughter's swimming. You know, and, and, and so that they, they came in first place, and I was, like, just insanely proud of, of my daughter. And, 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 and then afterwards, she goes to me. This is what she said. She says, Daddy, thank you for challenging me. And I was like, oh, thank God. And I'm like, you know what you're doing now, Lily? And she's like, what's that, Daddy? I'm like, now you're giving me permission to continue to challenge you to do things that you don't think you're able to do. And, and the reason I share that story of Lily is because that is what James is doing. He is challenging a church to do something that they didn't think they were capable of doing, challenging them to, to change. And, and it is hard to get people to change a way that they have been doing things for so long. And, and one of the things that James, the main thing that he is trying to get them to change is the favoritism and the partiality that they are showing towards certain types of people. Uh, he, he says, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, of our glorious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, stop showing favoritism. Like they're treating other people differently based off of what they look like on the outside. They're treating people differently based off of their economic status. They're treating people differently based off of their race, their gender. And, and James is saying, what is wrong with you? Do you not realize what Jesus has done for you? Do you not realize that Jesus put skin and bone on, came down and gave you a gift that you did not deserve, not based off of anything that you did, not based off of your merit, not based off of your good looks or your good deeds. He gave you this free gift. He gave it to you. And now you who have received this freely, you didn't earn it, you just receive it, are now showing partiality and favoritism towards other people. What is wrong with you. And then James gives this example. He says, he says, this is what's going on, is that there's people coming into church, and, and, and they look nice. They have, they have gold rings on and fine clothes, and, and you're giving them preferential treatment. And, and then somebody who is, is poor, and, 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 and they, don't, they don't have nice clothes, you're, you're telling them to sit on the floor. It's not right. It's messed up. And what James is referring to is, you know, back then, people who had gold rings, they dressed uh, very, very, very nicely. They were typically uh, influencers. They were typically like politicians. They were typically people who could do things for the church. And when they came in, the people that could do something for the church, they were getting preferential treatment. And the people that could not do anything for them were, were, were kind of treated like second-class citizens. And so this is my question to you. Do you treat people differently based off of what they could do for you? And then the people that can't do anything for you, you treat them another way. Because I, I, I think all, all of us, this is so relevant because all of us, we, we have our, our preference. We, we, we have uh, the, the types of people that we like, the types of people that we're drawn to. And then we have the other people that really can't do anything for us. And, and, and because of that, we usually don't have the time of day for them like we would for someone that, that could actually help us. And, and, and Jesus is using James, his brother, to, to write to this church and saying, stop living this way. 
Stop showing your favoritism towards people that, that don't look like you, talk like you, have the same economic status as you. And, 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 and Jesus is saying, don't you want to be like me? Who wants to be like Jesus? Like Jesus wants us to live like him. And Jesus is the greatest example of this. Jesus was one who didn't need anything from us. There's nothing that we could do for Jesus. And yet Jesus saw us and saw something in us. And he said, you know what? I want to come down and I want to save them. I want to be their savior. And, and this is what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Uh, I'll read it out of the message translation. It, it, it says, God put his love on the line for us by offering his son as a sacrificial death while we were of no use to him. Be like this. We have this bearded dragon at our house. And, and this bearded dragon, what does the bearded dragon eat, Diamond? Crickets, lots of crickets, devours these crickets. It would be like me seeing this happening and me feeling uh, just, just passionate to want to help these crickets. I want to help these crickets. I want to save these crickets. I, I want to I see these crickets thrive. And, and then, and then uh, God, how do I do it? And God's saying the only way to save the crickets is you've got to be a cricket. Oh, no. I don't want to be a cricket. <laughs> and God's like, nope, that's, that's the only way. What's their lifespan? Ooh, not good. Uh, you know, but, but that's the only way you can save the crickets is if you become a cricket and, and that I'd have to become a cricket and live with the crickets and live like a cricket, live a cricket life because that's the only way to save them. Jesus did the same thing for you. You had no value to him and yet his, he loved you so much he became a cricket. He became a human so that he could save you. And you, little cricket, are now showing partiality towards other crickets. And James is frustrated with it. What's wrong with you? How could you show your partiality like that? How, how could you live like that? And he's frustrated. And, and the message to, to believers, and, and it says brothers and sisters, which means he's talking about family. Talking about fa We're a family, aren't we? Like we're either a crowd or we're a family. And, and, and I, I believe that we are the family of God. And how unhealthy would it be if there was favoritism in a family? Like in my family, you know, as, as a father, uh, I, I, I mean, how unhealthy would it be if, if I showed favoritism to one child over another? If, if we went out to eat and, and I sat down and I'm like, all right, all right, Judah, Lily, Mommy, you're sitting at this table. Dewey, you're, you're going to go in the corner. <laughs> no, daddy, no. No, no, like, like how, how messed up? Like, oh, we're all going to sit on the front row. Uh, Judah, you, you go sit in the back. You know, you, you, uh, we're, we're all going to go out to eat. Lily, um, um, you, you, you just stay home because, you know, we don't like you as much. I mean, that, that would be unhealthy. That would be horrible. And yet, that is what James is saying is happening in the church. His people are showing favoritism. They're they're, they're saying that sin's acceptable, that sin's not acceptable. Uh, you know, I, I want to spend more time with this person because they could do something for me, and this person that, that really can't do anything for me, I, I just kind of shun them and ignore them and tolerate them. And, and James is saying that is not what Jesus did for you. Jesus saw you all. He didn't see you as, as good and bad. He saw you with the same love and the same grace, and he rescued you. And, and he says, you need to learn this. Love your neighbor. So who is my neighbor? You know, this, this is a question that people dealt with uh, back in this time. Like, like, define neighbor. Who's my neighbor? The same person that lives in the, in the neighborhood with me. And Jesus uh, gives this example in the book of Luke about the Good Samaritan. And he talks about the Good Samaritan as this person that every Jewish man and woman would have been appalled about. Because there was so much uh, um, racism and segregation and partiality back then. And, and, and people had different levels of worth back then. And they saw people based off of what they could do for them. And, and he's, he looked at this, this Samaritan and all the Jewish believers would have looked at a Samaritan as someone who really had no value, had, had no worth. And yet Jesus is saying a good neighbor is not somebody who loves people that have the same look as them, that talks the same way, that votes the same way, that lives the same way, but a neighbor is anyone who is a child of the most high God. And if you don't learn this, then you're guilty of all, you're sinning. You're in sin. That's what he says. If you show favoritism, if you don't love your neighbor, you're a sinner. And if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of them all. 
You know what I have found? I have found that the greatest messengers in my life are the strangers. We learned about this in our leadership class, how important it is to invite the strangers to your table. What is a stranger? A stranger is someone who does not look like you, does not talk like you, does not vote like you, does not have the same economic status as you, does not have the same background as you, does not think the same way as you because of what they've gone through as a child, as a young person. That is a stranger, and this is the problem with so many believers, particularly in America, is they only invite people to their table who they are comfortable with, that they agree with. And here we are, here we are in America, yelling and screaming and bickering, judging everyone because they're a stranger to us. And this is what the book of Hebrews says. It says, be kind to strangers. Be hospitable to strangers because you may be entertaining an angel unaware. I, I mean, j just from an angelic standpoint, I don't want to offend angels. But what that word angel, it means is it's a messenger. Somebody that has a message for you. I have learned so much more from strangers than I ever have from people that think the same exact way as I do, that agree on every single point as I do. I, and if you don't entertain strangers and invite strangers to your table and invite people into your life that might not think the same way that you do, you are going to stay stuck. And, and really what James is saying is you're living in sin. And we need to begin to entertain strangers. And, and I, I think a lot of times we get stuck in our traditions is the problem. Is, is this is the way my parents did things? This is the way I'm used to doing things? This is the way I've always done things? And, 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 and any sort of change, any, anything that, that, that pulls at our traditions, we run from or we get angry at. I was a story that uh, uh, my, my friend Anthony McGarrow always tells me of, uh, of this, th this woman who she would make a ham every single Friday. And before she would make the ham, she would always cut the ends off of the ham. And the kids didn't understand why she did this. And the kids said, Mom, why do you cut the ends off of the ham? And the mom says, you know what? I'm not really sure. My mom always did it this way. Uh, let me call her and ask. So, so she calls up her mom, says, Mom, why did you always cut the ends off? off the ham before you made it for our Friday night dinner because it was tradition. It was the way they always did things. And then the mom says, you know what? I'm not really sure. Grandma always did it that way, right? Madra like, always did it that way. Let me call her up and ask. And we call up the grandmother who's 90 years old. Uh, they said, Grandma, why did you always cut the ends off of the ham? And, and Grandma said, well, back, back then the ovens were so small, the only way to fit the ham in the oven is you had to cut the ends off of it. And then Grandma's like, you're still doing that? Like, yes, Grandma. Like, you don't even know why you do the things. It's just the way it's always been. It's how I've always been. And the thing is, we got a bigger oven now. When you're saved by grace, you, you, you got more grace to give. Now you got a bigger oven. Now, now because I have been shown grace, I want to extend it to the world. That's how Jesus wants us to live. Not stuck in our traditions, the way things have always been, or the way I always believe. And, and you know what? We live in a country of traditions. Tradition, tradition. And how many times do we hold up our traditions above the truth of Jesus Christ? I'll tell you the truth of Jesus Christ, which is love your neighbor as yourself, needs to be a higher standard other than the traditions of our country and our family. I serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you know what? I want to extend that love to my neighbor, even if it's not part of my tradition. Can I challenge you this morning? You're limiting yourself. You're limiting your influence. You're limiting what God can do through you because you're not allowing strangers at your table. What do you do for the people that can't do anything for you? That's why I love the Dream Center so much. That's why the heartbeat of this church is to serve those that, that, that can't do anything for our church and to just love them. Just love our neighbors. Just give them food. Give them diapers. Give them love. And go door to door and, and ask, how can we serve you as a church? How can our Dream Center love you and serve you? And don't even care. If they don't come to church, I, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. See, I, I think the church has missed it so often as is, is we go into an outreach, we put together a program so that we can put more people in the seats. And our, our goals is always, how, how do we get the, the world in the church? And Jesus says, my goal is to get the church in the world. 
And, and, and that, that needs to be the mission of this church forever is how can we get our church into the world? How can we get it into our community? Whether or not they come to our church, whether or not they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, it doesn't matter. That's still a son or daughter of the Most High, and I'm going to serve them, and I'm going to love them, and I'm not going to show someone else favoritism because they can do something for me. And James is frustrated, and, and you can see why. And then, and then he says, verse Verse 10, he says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it. All. How could you ever be judgmental towards anyone ever when you're guilty of the same thing? That's what James is trying to boil it down to. Is you're judging people, you're, you're, you're showing preferential treatment to certain people, and yet you are all guilty of the same sin. And I didn't even give you my first point because I'm about to go on to my second one. And I only have two. Do I hear an amen? My first point was, which I'm closing, is love is blind. Blind love. Blind love. And my second point is messy faith. Blind love and messy faith. And the second part of this sermon I want to start reading in, in verse 14, because James starts, starts talking about, uh, uh, you know, mercy, and he talks about how you've been extended so much grace and so much mercy from God. How could you go out and judge the world or judge others, and you need to extend mercy, be a dispenser of mercy, and, and you, you know what our problem is, is we, we don't know how to, how, how to handle this gift that we have been given. Has anyone ever had somebody pay their check at dinner before? Anybody? All right, let me go a little further. Has anyone like randomly had someone pay for their check? Like you thought you were going to have to pay and then somebody else paid for it? Like Joe Responti. Joe Responti, the other day we went out to, went out to lunch and, and he paid for my lunch. I was so pumped. I kind of like expected it, but uh, just between. <laughs> but, but you know what? This, this, so I, I, I thanked him. You know what I didn't do? I didn't say, oh, you're going to pay. Let, let me get, like, some to-go, you know. <laughs> let me get some dessert, some coffee, you know. Like, well, my, you know, we got a bearded dragon at home. Got to get him a cheeseburger, Joe. You know, like, like, I didn't do that. I was gracious. And see, what happens is you have been extended so much grace, it, it doesn't make you want to abuse it and, and, and add to what God has already forgiven you of. It makes you want to dispense it. It makes you want to pay it yeah, isn't that fun? Like, 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 you ever go to Starbucks line, someone pays for yours, and they're like, oh, that's awesome. Now what are you going to do if you're a good person, if you're a Christian person? You pay for the next one. And because it, it's awesome. And that's what Jesus is saying. That's what you, you need, you're supposed to do. Is, is I've given you so much grace. Now go and pay it forward. You are such a selfish person if you are forgiven of so much, and yet you can't forgive and love your own brother Pay it forward. It's, it's messy faith. And, and this is the reason why so many people don't like Christians. Like you realize that, right? Is that Christians are hypocrites. And I know like deep down, yes, we're all hypocrites because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Christians so often have such a tough time forgiving and loving people who don't agree with them. Like, we really struggle with this. Uh, I, I thought it was, it was interesting, this one philosopher, his name is G.K. Chesterton. He said, the biggest argument against Christianity <laughs> is the behavior of Christians. <laughs> the biggest reason why nobody wants to be a Christian is because of the way Christians behave. <laughs> and I, I, to be honest, I couldn't agree more. And this is what James, James is dealing with the same thing. This is what he says. He says, what good is it, my brother and sister, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of them says, just go in peace, keep warm and well and well fed, but doesn't do anything for their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith itself, not accompanied by action, is nothing. It's dead. I remember uh, growing up, my father would always teach me this concept of uh, if you ever go anywhere, you go in somebody else's car, 
You, you, you go to someone else's house, you sleep in someone else's bed. Um, this is what you, just, just leave no trace that you were even there. Like pick up your trash, you know, make the bed, clean the floor. Like make sure, like, like if anybody goes, it doesn't even seem like you were the, anyone taught that. Like, like, and that's the right way to live, right? Like, like leave no trace. You know, that's not the right way to live when Jesus comes in your life. And yet that's the way a majority of Christians live is they leave no trace that anything has actually happened in their life. Like nothing changes, <laughs> literally. Like, like that mentality does not transcend into the kingdom of God. Jesus wants messy faith. Like, like my son Dewey. Like you know where Dewey's been. <laughs> like like, like you, can, you, you, go, you go in a room and you're like, Dewey's been here. <laughs> like it's, nothing's anywhere that it's supposed to be. Like, like, you know, he, he, Dewey's been in this car. You know, there, it's, it's, just, it's just obvious because Do, Dewey's been there. Live the Dewey life. Live the Dewey life. That when Jesus comes in your, your heart, you, don't, you leave a trace of Jesus everywhere in every aspect of your life. Everybody knows that there is something different about you. You're not the same because faith changes you. If you don't change, then you don't have Faith. Wait a second. I thought, I thought I don't work for my faith. That's right, you don't work for your faith, but you can't have fruitless faith. It's an oxymoron. See, your actions justify what has happened in your life. Like in, in, in the same way, uh, uh, yes, yes, the, the, the truth doesn't need to be prove, proven, but in order for people to see what has happened in you, you have to prove what God has done. Let me give you an example. Uh, uh, because, like, like, anyone ever been sick before? You, you know, you, you go into work, or you get sick, or uh, maybe school. What do, what do you need? You, you, you're, you take a sick day, you're sick, but then you go back to school. What do you need? You need a note to justify what happened in your life, to prove what happened in your life. Because if you don't have the note, how are they going to know that you ever were actually sick? Maybe you were faking it. Maybe you were Ferris Bueller, day off, you know, driving her all around Chi-Town, you know, crashing cars. You know, how do I know unless you don't have a note? H how does the world know that anything has happened in you if nothing changes? Too many people live the, the verse 19 life that you guys all, uh, all got excited about in the very beginning. Remember, remember that? Uh, um, you believe that there is one God. Awesome. Even the demons believe that. The only way the world is ever going to see Jesus is through you. And we can't love other people. People look at Christians and say, my gosh, I'd rather be an atheist because at least they can love their neighbor. Look at these Christians. Anyone that doesn't believe like them, they persecute. They curse out. They judge like, why would I ever want to be a Christian? And, and James is saying, if, if you really love Jesus, what comes from you is love. That's the fruit that we produce. The, the, the fruit that we have received is love. The fruit that we produce is love. And if we don't extend love, how are we ever going to change the world? How are we going to ever show the world Jesus? And us as a church, we need to live up to that standard. It is not enough just to say, I love Jesus. It is not enough just to come to church. It is not enough just to sing songs and then go out and, have a, and go to a restaurant and treat the waiter like they're a robot. It, it's, not, it's not enough to, to be a Christian, sing songs, and, and then, and then go, go on Facebook, and anyone that doesn't agree with you, you just, you just cuss them out. You just disregard them. Treat them like, like they're not even human. Treat them like they're dumb, they're stupid, because they don't have the same opinion as you. James is talking to you. He's preaching to me. He's preaching to you. See, it's, it's one thing, oh, do, can I have a stool? Dan, could you get me a stool or a chair, something? I'm tired. Like, I'm preaching so hard, I need a stool. Like, like, like I need, like, what is this, Dan? That's, it, it's a, it, what is this? A stool, a stool, that's right. And, 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 you know, I, I see that stool, and, I think that, that that stool was made to hold a person up. 
who's tired and wants to sit down. That's what I, I believe. See, a, a lot of people believe of God, believe of Jesus. Believe that, that he's the, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Believe just like these demons that, that, man, there is power in that name. You guys sang that song so good. It's power in the name of Jesus. There's power, right? Like you say that, you sing it. Even the demons know that. <laughs> like for sure they know that. They shudder. That's what it says. They even shudder at that name. See, I can say all I want that that stool is going to hold me, that that stool is real, and, and it, it was made to hold me. I believe in it, but until I take the action to actually sit in it, then how will anybody else believe me? See, this is the challenge that I want to leave you to. It's this week, sit in the stool. Don't just talk about the stool. Don't just come to church and sing about, I'm, when I say stool, I'm talking about Jesus. You, you get this, right? And, and, and don't, don't just talk about it, sing about it. Show the world that it actually works. Rest in Jesus. Show, show the world what forgiveness and love actually looks like. How you're able to love people who don't agree with you how you're able to love your neighbor, how you're able to rest in Jesus and have peace in the middle of a storm, that he really is the anchor for your soul, that you're, you're really a, a changed person. I don't just believe of it, I believe on it. Amen? Amen. Let's just bow our heads right now. Father, we thank you so much that you, man, you, you put skin and bone on to save us. We were of no use to you, and yet, for some reason, you loved us so much. That you desired to spend eternity with us. And you went through the ultimate sacrifice. God, I, I just pray this morning, Father God, that every single one of us, that, that our, the world won't just know us by our confession or won't know us by, uh, you know, the fact we, we put on a, a, a social media post that, you know, at, at Shore Christian Church this morning. But God, I just pray, Father, that this world will know us by our fruit. Know us by the way that we love our neighbors. Know us by the way that we're able to interact with other people, Father God. That we won't show favoritism or partiality, Lord God, but I pray, Father, that we'll be able to extend love and grace to everybody in our network and even those outside of our network, Lord God, because we are all in the family of God. Every person is a son or daughter of the Most High with immense potential that you created them with. And Father, I believe that the only way that they're ever going to see it is through us, through the love and the mercy that we're able to extend to them by the fact that we're not just going to talk over them, but we'll actually listen to them and love them and go out and serve in our community and be a church that is not just singers and sayers of the word, but is willing to go out on the streets and serve the community and love the community and build buildings for the community community, not for us, but for the community, to love them with a radical, everlasting love. Why? Because you have given us so much. Father, forgive us, forgive me for the areas that we have fallen short, Lord God. Pray, Lord, that the fruit that comes out of us will be the difference and the change that the world can see in Jesus' name.